to, to um, disconnect the idea of progress from the idea of growth, uh, because we live on a finite planet, and and that growth in material consumption cannot continue on, on this planet uh, indefinitely. Uh, so uh, the first the first step is to refocus on the idea of uh, sustainable human well-being and the well-being of the rest of, of nature as well. Um, and once we change our goals, and once we really understand what contributes to that sustainable well-being, I think we can, we can get past this idea of, of growth being the, the main thing that's contributing. And many biological uh, analogies you could point to where organisms grow for a while, and then they, uh, their growth stops, they, they stabilize, and then they continue to improve and, and develop, if you will, but their uh, you know, growth can't continue indefinitely. So I think we're at the same point in our economic development uh, where we have to shift from uh, a focus on, on growth, we're not teenagers anymore, uh, and we need to, to focus on a more uh, <clears throat> mature kind of economy that's not, not growing, but that's providing stable, sustainable well-being to a much larger fraction of the, the human population as well. We, you know, we know that um, uh, GDP, material emission, you know, have increased rapidly in the last in the last hundred years or so. Uh, but we also know from recent psychological research is that, uh, that that growth in income hasn't really uh, contributed to improving well-being in the last several decades. I mean, it's, it's good up to a point. Certainly, uh, material consumption contributes to well-being, but it's, but it's only one of many things. And uh, so it's not the, the end, and it's, it's not the end, it's a means to an end. And I think the first step is to really recognize that, get beyond this idea that, that our goal is growth. Uh, because our goal is not growth, our goal is well-being. We need measures that are better indicators of economic well-being. I think there's lots of interest in generating those new indicators. One example is something called the Genuine Progress Indicator, uh, which is still a consumption-based indicator, but at least it's, it's separating the negative from the positive uh, sides of consumption. GDP uh, was never designed as a measure of economic well-being. It's really only a measure of economic activity or income. And so you know, any activity is considered to be good as the GDP. So if there's an oil spill or a war or pollution, etc., it's all, I think, fairly well known and it is being uh, better recognized these days. Uh, but the question is, what's What's the alternative? Well, the genuine progress indicator starts with personal consumption expenditure, and it weights them by income distribution. So it takes explicitly takes on board this idea that if you're talking about welfare instead of income, you've got to worry about how that income is distributed. You know, GDP, as far as GDP is concerned, it, you know, Bill Gates made all of the income in the whole, in the whole world. Uh, and that would be exactly the same as if that income were distributed equally among, among everyone. Weighted by income, and then add a few things that are left out of GDP, like the value of volunteer work and the value of household labor. Obviously, good things, but they're not, they're not internalized in the market. And then it subtracts a whole bunch of things that are left out, like uh, the cost of commuting, you know, the cost of crime, the, the uh, uh, depletion of natural capital uh, assets, air and water pollution, etc. Uh, and take all those things into account. And in the uh, U.S., for example. Even though GDP has been growing essentially since the since 1950, with some uh, minor recessions and, and ups and downs, GPI, the Gender and Progress Indicator, uh, flattened out in about 1975 and hasn't really been improving ever since then. You get what you measure. If all we measure is GDP, that's all we that's all we're going to get. What we really need to measure is is human well-being and how how it's changing. I just came back from a trip to Bhutan, actually, and uh, you know, they, they have declared that their national goal is gross national happiness, not gross national product. Now what they mean by happiness, I think happiness has somewhat of the wrong connotation in, in the West. I mean, it's, uh, what they mean by it is more a sense of, of uh, longer term well-being, you know, a sense of, of uh, quality of life and, uh, and that sort of thing. Not momentary happiness, not updated, sort of hedonistic uh, happiness. Uh, so <clears throat> I think uh, what they're pursuing is something very close to what we all should be uh, pursuing, this idea of sustainable, sustainable well-being. Uh, 
you have a certain point, more material consumption that really contribute to people's, um, people's happiness or well-being. Um, it's connections with other people, it's their social relationships, uh, it's their connection uh, with nature. Uh, it's, it's a whole range of things that don't really enter into the market. So, you know, if our goal really is sustainable well-being, we had better better understand what that what that means and how to and how to achieve it. And I think that's that's the agenda uh, going forward. Uh, first of all, to reclaim that goal, and say what are we really after, and uh, and then to, um, uh, to 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 better understand how to how to achieve that goal. A recent book by Wilkinson and Pickett called The Spirit Level presented data that shows that the worse the income distribution is among countries, uh, the worse the whole range of social problems uh, are. Uh, so this idea that, that uh, we need a relatively fair distribution of wealth and resources in order to build social capital, in order to, for people to, uh, to have a, a, a desirable uh, society. And in the United States in particular, uh, that income distribution has been getting much worse over the last several decades. And I think this is what the, the Occupy movement is, is reacting to, the, the 1% of the population that, that now hold uh, too much of the, of the wealth and resources. And that's affecting not only the people in the other 99%, it's affecting the people in the 1%, because we all want a good and prosperous society uh, going forward. The idea of an efficient allocation of resources. We want to use our resources efficiently. We can't do that unless we include in that allocation mechanism everything that's important to human well-being. And right now we use the market to allocate resources, but the market doesn't include uh, many of those uh, those contributions. There's lots of things that are external to the market, externalities like the contributions of nature, the contributions of, of society, of social capital. And, uh, and many other things. So how do we bring those things into the, the decision-making structure? Uh, we don't want to uh, necessarily use the market uh, to, to allocate resources like natural and social capital. We need other kinds of, of institutions like uh, common asset trust is one idea that's been, that's been proposed. How do we make sure we can no longer uh, grant open access to those resources, things like the atmosphere, which have been open access in the past. We have to somehow you know, attach property rights and restrictions on their, on their, uh, on their use, uh, but that has to be on behalf of the whole community, not on behalf of, of uh, private individuals. So the challenge there is, is how do we better manage uh, the commons, our, our, uh, our natural and social commons, things like the atmosphere and the oceans. We do have the possibility, uh, and, and in fact the necessity, to build a sustainable and desirable uh, future uh, with an economy that's not growing in material terms, because that's no longer possible. And it's also no longer desirable uh, from, a, from the point of view of, of, uh, of improving well-being. But I think we need to frame this issue in a much more positive way for the general public. I think the environmental movement and others have, have framed this issue in a very negative way. You know, climate change is a big problem. We're going to scare people. We have to stop doing what we're doing, um, and that doesn't really motivate people to change uh, uh, around these sort of longer-term issues. Uh, what's needed is a really much more positive framing of the issue. We can create a better world. We can create a world where people are happier, where they're, they're better off, uh, where, and they don't need uh, to have, you know, continue economic growth in order to do that. In fact, that gets in the way of them being better off. The word that I've learned in uh, Swedish is this word, lagom, of the G-O-M. Lagom in Swedish uh, means a state where everybody's happy, everybody has enough, everybody's, everybody's suffering, but uh, there's no sort of uh, necessary ex excess uh, going around. So, you know, if you, if you say lagom, it means everything's good. That's the kind of society that we, uh, that we need to be aiming for.